Today, we've got one of the bravest women in Scotland campaigning for a gross miscarriage of justice. And Sandra, I've watched some of her interviews online. She has written a book. And we're going to get to that, Innocence Betrayed. Johnny Boy Steele, who's been on the podcast multiple times, started contacting me saying, look, I'm campaigning for this guy, Luke Mitchell, who was only 15 years old when he got sent down for a murder that he hadn't committed. Johnny Boy Steele said, look, my brother Joe Steele was in prison for decades for a murder he hadn't committed. I'm referencing the ice cream wars there. And it's something we can actually act on now to prevent Luke from having to suffer any longer because he is presently suffering. He's been inside now for 16 years, busted when he was 15 for a crime he hadn't committed, and he's presently around 33, 34 years old. So Sandra has... When she started to campaign for this, she could not leave her house without being pulled over or harassed by the cops. And she stuck with it. She was not intimidated. She stuck with it. She has said on one of her interviews that if anything happens to her, her legacy is secure. She's written her book. She's put the word out there and that she hopes that her mission will continue. So I know the viewers watching this are going to see exactly how brave she is and what a absolutely wonderful and worthy cause she is championing. Now, obviously, there are many cases of, you know, injustice all over the world. If you've watched the Making a Murderer series, I do believe those guys are innocent of the murder of Teresa Holbach, no matter what people think about the characters. In particular, Brendan Dassey, snatched from his school, told he could go home and watch WrestleMania if he confessed to a horrible torture murder that he hadn't committed. His IQ so low that he just went, went ahead and, and told the police what they wanted to hear. He was fact-fed and serving a life sentence alongside Stephen Avery, also serving a, long, a life sentence. In my book, on Making a Murderer, it's 10 chapters, and each chapter focuses on one of the methods prosecutors, detectives, authorities use to frame innocent people. And although I'm coming to this case, and I don't know, you know, I've got nowhere near the level of knowledge that Sandra has. I've only watched a few of her interviews. I've not read her book, but I'm going to get around to it. I can guarantee that these 10 things that they used to frame Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are going to come up when Sandra lays this story down about how they did this to Luke Mitchell. And I've been scratching my head ever since the Ray Cron case, the Snaggletooth killer in Arizona, where the state paid $50,000 to get an expert witness to say that his teeth matched a bite mark on a victim when they knew it didn't. And they suppressed his DNA, the DNA, because it didn't match him. And they sentenced him to death knowing he was innocent. And I've been scratching my head ever since that case, which woke me up to the fact that there are bigger criminals in the justice system than there are in the prison. And I've been scratching my head wondering, why do they do these things? Is it institutionalized? Do they do it consciously? Do they do it subconsciously? Are they careerists? When they find out, you know, when the more evidence comes to light that someone's innocent, why, why do they try and get, get someone executed anyway? Are these people psychopaths? <sighs> so perhaps Sandra is going to be able to shed some light on that because we're going to discuss that in the context of the Luke Mitchell case. All right, so that is my introduction anyway. Sorry, it's been a bit long, this one. Um, so thanks for coming on, Sandra. Thanks for having me. Could you tell us who Luke and Jody are first, just so we can establish before we, before we get to the actual uh, crime allegation? So back in 2003, two 14-year-olds uh, attended the same high school, St. David's High School, um, kind of got to know about each other through friends and then got together, started going out with each other. 14-year-old relationship. Um, 
by all accounts, really enjoyed each other's company. You know, just just a couple of kids, really, mm. early relationship. Um, and then one night, Jodie was supposed to come to New Battle, where Luke lived, and she didn't turn up. So Luke phoned his mum and said, you know, if she turns up later, we're going to be over in the Abbey, a group of them, send her over. Later that night, about uh, 10.38, so 20 to 11 at night, Luke gets a text from Jodie's mum saying, right, Toad, two weeks grounding, up the road now. So Jodie's phone was broken, hence the text to Luke's phone. So he immediately phoned Jodie's mum and said, I haven't seen her. She, she, didn't, she didn't turn up earlier. So there's some frantic to and fro and an, arra an arrangement is made between Luke and Jodie's mum that he'll go up the path that they would have taken as a shortcut. Sorry, that jo uh, Jodie would have taken as a shortcut to, to Luke's house. If he doesn't see her on the way, he'll go to Jodie's mum's house and the grown-ups will decide what to do next. He had some phone numbers, um, friends' numbers that maybe our mum wouldn't have had. You know, the sort of thing, you know, we need to contact anybody that she might have been with. So he sets off and he's about two-thirds of the way up the path and he sees some people in the darkness at the top of the path. So this is after 11 o'clock at night. But it was June 30th, so it was daylight till after 10 o'clock that night. So it only not that long got dark. And Jodie's gran, her 17-year-old sister, and her 19-year-old boyfriend were waiting at the, the top of the path for Luke. And the gran suggested a double check that they go back down the path Luke had just come up. So they go back down and there's a V break in the wall. Just past the V break, Luke's dog, who was training to be a tracker, goes nuts. She's up scrabbling at the wall and, and Luke's like, uh oh, yeah, that looks like an alert. So he doubles back to the V break over the wall and Jodie was naked, brutally murdered, her hands, her arms tied behind her back with her own trousers, throat cut 12 to 20 times, and her body mutilated, mutilated after death. So he's 14. He's gone over, he's seen this, and he's called out, I think there's something here. The sister's boyfriend then goes over, and then the gran insists on being helped over to see what's there as well. So th the three of them have gone over the wall. The only one that didn't go over the wall was Jodie's 17-year-old sister. Um, the, other, the other three had all been over the wall and individually down to, to see what was there. Luke said at first that he thought it was a, a tailor's mannequin. He just saw the, the white legs and thought of it, and it wasn't until he got closer and shone the torch. Um, the, the grand said she thought it... No, sorry, the sister's boyfriend said he thought it was an old... You know, the white speckled logs. Mm -hmm. that, so each of them, when they first saw it, did not want to believe that it was anything untoward. But a few steps closer, and that was that was what set this, this whole 18-year nightmare into, into progress. So you said Luke had a dog? Yes. And what, what was the nature of that dog? It was an Alsatian, a, a German shepherd, and she was training to be a tracker. For no what, what do you mean by a tracker? A, a, a sniffer, like um, the thing they do where they, they hide things and the dogs have to go and find them by scent. Um, okay. For, for no other reason than a hobby. Yeah. She, she wasn't training to be a, a professional yeah. working dog. It was mm -hmm. just that um, actually the guy who was training her Yeah had noticed that she had a real aptitude for this and had approached them and said, yeah. I used to train mm -hmm. these dogs. Would you like to see how, how well she does? Yeah. So that that was how they ended up starting to train her as a tracker. So it was the dog that alerted the party that something was behind the fence. Behind the wall, yeah. The wall. It, it was a stone wall, high a stone, stone wall. wall. So there was a path there, a shortcut that she would, she'd been taking... Is that is that was that in that proximity? That's that's the that's the official line. 
so th there's a, a small path in front of this this stone wall. Yeah. And then the woodland strips behind the stone wall. So it's this path in front yeah. that it was claimed she was walking down as a shortcut yeah. towards Luke's end of the path. But we, we now know there are several other ways into that woodland strip that don't involve having to come down that path and over the wall. You can come in from the other side. So over the wall then, was that an expanse of land? The the woodland strip behind the wall yeah. is maybe 30, 40 feet wide. It's not particularly big. And then there's a right. big open field ah, behind that yeah. that's completely enclosed. There, It doesn't look out onto any roads or houses or anything. Just this big open field yeah. at the other side of the woodland strip. All right, so who, in what order did they jump over the wall? So Luke went over first. Luke first, yeah. He called out, I think there's something here. The sister and her boyfriend had continued down the path. Yeah. So they came running back. Yeah. And the sister's boyfriend went over. Uh-huh. He, Luke kind of went down there, you know. Yeah. So he went down the same way Luke had gone. And same thing. He came back and then the, the two boys helped. The gran she was 67. Yeah. So the two boys helped the gran over the wall. So it wasn't that high a wall then? <clears throat> the bottom of the V was about four feet from the ground. Yeah. But the wall itself was about seven feet high. Right. Most most of the length of it. Okay. So they get they all get over the wall. It's ascertained that it's Jody. And is there a call to the authorities at that point? The the granny while the granny was coming back back up so she'd gone down and um uh, the original report was that she cradled Jodie that was later changed to she touched her forehead yeah and as she was coming back up Luke dialed 999 yeah they got the gran over the wall and then as Luke was coming over the wall behind her his phone rang a second time or his phone rang yeah and it was the police saying where are you mm -hmm. because there are two three paths behind the school wow and they couldn't they couldn't figure out where he was. Yeah. So this was the operator phoning back at 11.30. So Jodie was found about 11.30, 11.33. Yeah. We called at 11.35 and the the operator called back at 11.38 saying, where are you? Mm -hmm. What was the footfall? Could you guess the average footfall on those paths at that time of the day? It, it was claimed that Jodie was killed at 5.15. Um, very, very precise in, in time the, here in, in the yeah. PM, yeah. Um, and at that time, we know there were around twelve people, either in the woodland strip or in the vicinity of the path. That's the ones we know about. Yeah. Nobody saw or heard anything. Right. Five fifteen. Yeah. Does that mean uh, there? There's more to the five fifteen as well, but. If nobody saw or heard anything at that time, there were kids in the woodland strip. Mm -hmm. There were there was a cyclist who cycled up the path yeah. who said he heard, initially, he heard a rustling sound, like leaves moving in a woodland strip, you don't see. Um, and then he, it changed to a struggling sound and finally to a strangling sound. But when he was asked at trial why he changed his statements, that, that particular bit of the statement, he said he was scared because he thought the police were treating him as a suspect. Mm. So, but we do know there were there were several people in that, and it's not a big area. The, the, the path itself is about 900 metres end to end. And... We had people in the kids playing in the woodland strip, dog walkers, uh, t a relative of Jody's and his friend on the path at exactly 5.15. So you already touched on one of the 10 things then, procuring false witnesses mm -hmm. by pressurising this person to think, I'm going to get in trouble here unless I tell these tell them what they want to hear. So much of it in this yeah, case. Yeah, You've got to remember that... The vast majority of these witnesses were kids, mm. 14 and under. And we know now that from day two, the police were going to their parents and saying, 
we know he did it. We'll we'll have him by the end of the week. And then when they're trying to speak to the kids, and if the kids don't say what they want them to say, they're going to the parents and saying, do you know what will happen if people find out your kids, like, taking sides with this little... So really, 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 really easy to manipulate yeah. really young witnesses and terrify their parents. What was the cause of death? Um, it was a cutthroat injuries. Cutthroat? Yeah, it, it, they, she, she was virtually decap- decapitated. Oh, my God. Was she gagged? No. Was she tortured before the, the, thro- the throat was cut? We know she was beaten. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Probably dragged by her hair because her hair was pulled out in clumps. Um, There were severe defensive injuries to her her arm, so she really, really put up a fight. So she would have been calling out as well, wouldn't she? I imagine so. Yeah. Um, The the injury to her face, so, so her cheek was cut from the corner of her mouth almost to her ear mm. and they couldn't say if that was done before or after death what kind of monster would do that it, it, it's it, beyond <sighs> beyond horrific 14 year old girl my, my daughters were a year and two years younger than Jodie at the time and that nightmare just I, whoever did that whoever did that has got to be an absolute maniac. And to think that they're still out there. Oh, yeah. That's even worse. Oh, God. What happened after the police were called? The fit-up begins immediately. Go on, then. Immediately. So the police finally locate the search party, the four of them. But in between times, one of the cops on the ground that's looking for them radios in and says, I think there's been a wee falling out. That's why he's galloping about the back of the school. Well, he now thinks that the two of them are behind the school at this time, even though Luke's told Jodie's mum he hasn't seen her all night. It then it, Where was Luke when this happened? When... At 5.15pm, where was Luke? He, he was at home uh, cooking dinner for his mum and his brother, which he did. And they were all in there with night. him? Um, after 5.15, yeah. Okay. But they didn't accept They didn't accept the alibi. They said his mum and his brother were lying to cover up for him. So that's exactly what they said about Stephen Avery. They said he drove from where he, he was uh, in a... In a Record as amount of time that he couldn't have possibly got to the play, the crime scene, because he was with his family. So his family were all liars. Again, talking record amount of time, I know we're jumping a bit here, but record amount of time, Luke, Luke supposedly got from his house to the East House's end of the path, which is where Jodie lived, back down to the V-break, lured Jodie over the wall, this fight with the, the dragon and the... the bashing over the head and the partial strangulation and all of that. And then, after she was dead, stripped her body, tied her hands and mutilated her body. Then made his way back home, got rid of all forensic evidence from himself and got rid of all forensic evidence from the crime scene but left left forensic evidence of other people there. Got himself completely changed and is back out on a wall at the end of the street within half an hour. 45 minutes max. So what, what time did they find the body? Uh, twen- just after half past 11 that night. Okay. All right, so the cops then, I assume, interviewed the search party. <laughs> you would have hoped so, wouldn't you? Yeah. So they arrive eventually, and straight away, the, one of them assumes that Luke and Luke alone found the body and the other three have arrived afterwards. So the other three are taken up to the car park behind the school by one of the officers, while the other asks Luke, the only child in the search party, to go back over the wall and show him where the body is. And Luke just goes, I'm not going back over there. So he's left standing on this path 
on his own, having seen what he's seen, while this police officer goes over and comes back and then takes Luke up to the car park. And this is where it just, the whole thing falls apart. They put Luke in the back of a police car, take his phone off him, switch his phone off. The rest of the, what I'm now calling the search trio, so the three members of Jodie's family, go and meet other members of Jodie's family who've turned up in the car park as well. Luke gets taken off to the police station straight away and they start questioning him straight away. The rest of the family search party go back to Jodie's mum's house. They, first they go to the local police station, then they go back to Jodie's mum's house. And it's four and a half hours later before they start to take their statements, by which time they've been speaking to the extended family, they've been speaking to each other, you know. So he's got two things against him at this point then, because it's um, a formula, isn't it? If you're the boyfriend, you're always the main suspect. If you find the body, you're often a suspect. In America now, they say if you find a dead body, don't call the police. Yeah. For, just keep keep walking. Yeah, that's your thing. Because you'll, you'll end up getting charged for yeah. it. Um, all right, so what did he say to them then when they were interviewing him? Did he say anything? I mean, you're a kid, you don't understand your words are going to be used against you. Did he give them anything they could twist to use against him? In the initial interview that night, because they, they took him straight from the car park and they kept him till nearly seven o'clock the following morning. Um, and he was in total shock just going through what was supposed to have happened, when Jodie was supposed to have arrived, what he did that evening, um, and what happened when they went out, when he went out looking for her. Um, they then raided his house on the 4th of July, so f four days later. They, they arrived and, and, you know, tore the place apart. The media, already primed, outside, waiting for it to happen, photographing bags and bags of what they kept referring to as evidence. It was stuff. They just kept taking stuff. They took every item of clothing he had, all the computers in the house. They just, they just took everything um, and found nothing. The accounts in that, that first interrogation, that first interview, were then brought back in what they called a Section 14 interview, six weeks later. Now, in Scotland in 2003, it was legal to take somebody in for a Section 14 interview, hold them for six hours with no access to legal advice or representation, mm. even a child. And that was legal in Scotland. Mm. So the Section 14 interview, the six weeks later interview, the that was the... That was the, the one where they used the read technique. That was the one where they just tried to break him, tried to confuse him, and comparing things that they were, they were trying to drive him to say in this interview with things that he'd said on the 4th of July when he was just there saying, anything I can do to help, anything I can tell you, anything that will lead you in the direction of who did this that, that might help. They then, six weeks later... They start picking bits out and saying, "Ah, but now you're saying this, and now," you're... and he hadn't actually changed what he was saying. You know that you know the approach where it, it's trying to manipulate and twist it to make it look like he said something different. And that's something that we went over in on making a murder. The read technique, um, its use on kids, its use on people with low IQs, its use on people with mental impairments. And the results it creates are just completely wrong. Mm. And there are people um, going around training cops now using the Brendan Dassey interview, the read technique, as examples of what not to do mm. when you're interviewing um, suspects. So it's, 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 it's just this, everything you're saying, it's the same stuff over and over again. Tell us a bit more about Luke. I mean, did he have any history of criminality or weird behaviour? History of criminality, no. Um, weird behaviour, well, like the rest of the crowd they hung around with, they were having a bit of a dabble with cannabis. Which is normal um, for kids. He was portrayed as a Marlon Manson fanatic. 
and it was into Satanism and <sighs> yes. <laughs> this is the next one, create an emotional reaction and get the media yeah. to hype it up. Satanic panic, all of that. Um, and the reality is none of it was true. None of it had anything to back it up. So they, they found one um, Marilyn Manson calendar ripped up in his bin and he had one CD with a bonus DVD that had come free in a magazine after Jody was murdered. That's it. That's his connection with Marilyn Manson. But what they did was they used the watercolour paintings, the Manson watercolour paintings of the Black Dahlia murder, murder in the 1940s in the United States and said Luke was Manson mad and he tried to carry out a copycat of the Black Dahlia murder. Yeah, um, the pathologist said that any similarities between the two murders were superficial. But there you have it. There's the big scary Satanist weirdo that's into Marilyn Manson and, and looking at these strange pictures. There's actually no evidence that Luke even knew about the pictures, far less that he'd seen them. Well, that's the next thing. When there's no physical evidence, it's like the detectives' minds just go to the most bizarre, crazy things. Absolutely. And they can just fill in the blanks with anything that they want. So they had Brendan Dassey saying all kinds of things, yeah. you know. And um, it's so obvious with him. They're like, well, you know, what did you do to her head? Oh, we cut her hair. No, what did you do to her head? Didn't you hurt her? Oh, we 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 punched her. No, no. Yeah. What did you do to her? Head? Um, and he, on and on he goes, like guess the answer. Yeah. And then they they just snap and say, "No, um, Brendan, tell us who shot her in the head." Yeah. He goes, "Oh yeah, it was Stephen. It was Stephen." So that was it. Conviction. Yeah, yeah. I think the opposite with Luke, because by the six weeks he knew he knew what they were trying to do. He knew really? they were trying to pin this on him. Yeah. He was a smart lad. You know, as an, he was an intelligent guy, and he's trying to answer the questions, but they're they're pushing him down alleyway, and he's trying to push back and saying, "I'm not going to say mm -hmm. what you're trying to get me to say because it's not true." And at one point, the, the, there's three cops, and they're doing the good cop, bad cop, one in, one out, all of this mm -hmm. nonsense, and they're screaming at him, uh, "We've got we've got your DNA DNA on Jody's bra and." You know, how do you explain that? It's it's DNA that's similar to yours. And he says, well, if it's similar, it's not mine. It has to be an exact match. <laughs> Good. They did Good not him. like it. Yeah. But what happened, again, the couple of times that they goaded and goaded and goaded until he snapped and either swore at them or told them they were idiots or whatever, they cherry-picked these bits from the interview to play to the jury yeah. to make him sound like he was belligerent, had no respect for authority. Yeah. Until you see the rest of this interrogation. Yeah. And you're like, no wonder. A grown adult would have snapped at that. It, that's another thing then, just cherry-picking part of someone's testimony to suit your narrative, yeah. false narrative. All right then, so where was Luke's legal counsel in all this? What was that person's role? You mean he's, he's... His lawyer. His lawyer at trial. Well, didn't he get a lawyer... Didn't they give him a lawyer right away? No, 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 no. <laughs> no that's what I'm saying. The Section 14 interview... Yeah. You, there's no access to legal advice or representation. But because they didn't charge him... Yeah. ...until the following April... Yeah. ...there was no legal team. Because... There was no charge. There's nothing to defend him against. What's except his, what's, for being aren't, his, aren't his parents, weren't they like doing anything in terms of getting him a lawyer or advising him at this stage? They assumed Trusting naively the police. that the police would realise they were heading down their own wrong track, yeah. get their act together and go in the right direction. Oh boy. And I've seen it, you know, I've worked on a lot of cases in the UK now, and you see it over and over again. There's not that same get legal representation mentality that there is in the States in this yeah, country. Yeah. And I think the legal aid thing has a lot to do with that. I think people trust that if they needed a lawyer, well, they would have got one, wouldn't they? Yeah. And and by the time they realise that's not the case, it's too late. <sighs> yeah, if you're ever in a situation like this, plead the fifth and ask for a lawyer. Because anything you say will be used against you yeah. in court. And you think you're... You can trust, you know, in the system. 
No, you cannot trust in the system. They are looking to put it on you at all costs. And it's no comment all the way. Yeah. Anything you say, anything. Yeah. They will find a way to twist it. Yeah. All right. Tell us a little bit more about Luke then. You know, what was it like for him as a kid growing up? What 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 kind of a person was he? Up until the year before he met Jody, his his thing was his pony. They they did a lot of outdoorsy stuff. So his his mum's um, business was caravan sales. So they did a lot of caravan holidays, uh, camping. He, he he did these survival weekends. You know, where they go away in the woods and they have to find their own shelter and everything. Um, so very much outdoorsy kind of pursuits. Um, his mum and dad split up when he was ten or eleven, but amicably. So, so there was no, no big hoo ha. He was still, still on good terms with both parents. Went to his dad's at the weekend. Um, so up to that point, really pretty normal, middle class, nice lifestyle. And how was he in school? Doing well. He was in um, the the top group for most of his classes. It, there was a bit of a, um, so so St David's was a, a religious a religion-based school, but they took pupils of all religions. Um, but Luke, being a typical 14-year-old, occasionally kicked back at the, the sort of that aspect of the school. Hence the, you know, the Satanism and all of that. It was it was having a poke at the the religious aspect of the school. Who wouldn't do that and smoke a bit of weed? Is, is that just everywhere? Mm-hmm. <sighs> Tell us a little bit more about Jodie then. What, what was she like as a young person? Jodie, from what I've come to learn of her, um, was she had her opinions and, <laughs> and, you know, she would stand by them. When she, when she was younger, to go back, when she was 10 nine or ten, her dad committed suicide. Oh, he, dear. he hung himself from a tree in the garden. Yeah. Um, so so there were difficulties for her. Her first couple of years at high school, she didn't settle well. She she was struggling. She was struggling to make friends and just generally not really settling. And then she seemed to, in that last year, she, she seemed to have just come into her own. And now she was becoming her own person and, you know, like I said, had her opinions, had her own thoughts about things and, and stuck by them. Yeah, you know, wasn't going to be pushed around, wasn't going to be told what she should think. So she was a fighter then? Mm-hmm. And um, so she's just living with her mum then, is she? And she got siblings. So she lived with her mum, her mum's partner and her elder brother. Her sister had moved out to live with the gran uh, three years previously. So, but but the sisters were, were still close. They just, the sister lived with the gran and Jodie lived with her mum. Did her mum and her mum's new partner approve of her relationship with Luke? Yes, initially, yes. Um, thought he was a nice lad and um, mum found out that the relationship had become sexual and was okay with that. She was going to take... Jodie to the GP to talk about contraception because she said Jodie was sensible and she wasn't concerned about it um, and that, that Luke was a nice lad, a polite boy initially. When did that change, What that attitude? Probably about a month after the murder when the search trio's stories started to change. So so these, these two feed into each other. Initially... Everybody said the dog reacted at the wall and that's why Luke went over. Um, the, our sister said the dog suddenly started jumping about at the wall. The boyfriend said, it's a big dog. Big dog is an Alsatian. When it was standing up against the wall, with its paws against the wall, its head was higher than the V. So these are, these are all clear indications of a dog reacting. By the end of July... The statements were starting to change. The dog didn't react. Luke didn't go past the V. He went straight to the V and over. The implication being, he knew, he must have known the body was there, and that's why he went 
over the wall. Now, we have a difficulty here because the prosecution wanted to have the cake, sorry, they wanted to eat their cake and have it, because on the one hand they were saying, Luke called Jodie's house, our, our landline, at 5.32 and 5.38 to see if Jodie had left yet. They said he did that to make it seem as though everything was normal because Jodie was dead by then. Then they said he distanced himself for the rest of the evening and then at half past 11, he leads them straight to the body. I mean, it makes no sense. <laughs> if he was distancing himself, then when Jodie's mum texted to say, right up the road, he could have just said he was sleeping. Due to the nature of what happened to her, the perpetrator would have been splattered. So what was the status of his clothes that day? Was he wearing the same clothes all day? And if he had changed his clothes, were they examined? He was, as I said, taken straight from the scene in a green bomber jacket, black T-shirt and baggy trousers that he'd been wearing all day. All day. And he'd been seen on the wall at the end of his street while he was waiting for Jodie by three boys from school who knew him. So so we know he was in the same clothes. Um, took him off to the station, took all those clothes, nothing. No forensic evidence whatsoever, not a scrap. It's right there then, isn't it? He couldn't possibly have done it and and committed those injuries unless it was on his it would it would be on his clothes yeah. if he was wearing those clothes all day. But once again, the the story grows arms and legs and wings and tails now because they say that actually he was wearing a parka jacket. Oh, God. And he somehow managed to get home, get his mum to burn the parka jacket in a log burner in the back garden. And she then goes and buys him an identical parka to make up for the missing one. And they but, can prove that, can they? Well, there's a difficulty with that because they took all the ash and, and uh, forensically examined the logs and the grate and everything in this log burner. And there was no evidence of anything other than logs being burnt there. So it's just something, again, they pulled out of the clear blue without any single yeah. shred of evidence. And that, that was based on one neighbour who said the smoke coming from the log burner that night smelled funny. Oh, God. And there were 30, <sighs> I think it was 35 or 36 other neighbours who, who were asked about smoke and log burners. Yeah. And they all either said... They couldn't remember. They, nothing, nothing stood out for them, or they smelled wood smoke. But one one neighbour came forward and said, "I had a citronella candle a few days after the, the murder. One a big citronella candle in the garden, and the whole thing went up. I don't know if you've ever smelled a citronella candle on fire. They stink. It's right. a horrible smell. Right. It was the police themselves who got the door and said to." Her, uh, your, your candle's doing things, you might want to go have a look at it. Yeah. So it's entirely possible that's that was what he smelled. But it's it's three or four nights after the murder. It's not it's not the night of the murder. There are people in this world who like to insert themselves into cases. Oh, and how. And that neighbour sounds just like one of those. He he already had um a very poor opinion of Colleen. I'm not going to tell you what he called her in his police statement. Of Connie? Corrine. Corrine. Luke's, sorry, Luke's mum. Oh, Luke's mum. Uh, he had a very, very, very poor opinion of her. Um, for no apparent reason that, that yeah. I know of. Yeah. But the way he referred to her whilst giving his police statement, she'd straight straight away have gone, well, hang on, you know, this guy appears to have a bit of a gripe with this woman. Might yeah. want to be a bit careful about what he's saying. But no... Of all the of all the statements about smoke, they took the two next door neighbours, direct next door neighbours, who said it was wood smoke, and this one guy that said it, it smelled of something weird, and used his statement to infer it was burning a parka, for which there was no forensic evidence. That goes back to the first one, then procuring fault witnesses, yeah. just um, false witnesses, cherry picking. Statements to fit your false narrative. It's textbook what's happened here. I can't believe this kid is still in prison. It's obscene. If there was nothing on his clothes, there's not a shred of DNA evidence. And we're only 30 minutes in, so I imagine it's going to get even more obscene. 
And um, huge shout out to Johnny Boy Steele for bringing this to my attention. What a great guy. And he's going around the country right now. I think they're doing like posters and putting them on police stations and stuff, he told me. Yeah. All right. So, in White House Farm Murders, mm -hmm. you see that, you know, the cops right away have decided that the sister's done it, killed herself and the family, the parents. But then you get like an uppity, um, I guess he was a detective who has his own theory yeah. and then gets people to fit that theory. Are there any uppity detectives involved in this? Um, most of them. Oh, God. <laughs> but, uh, it, from, from the off, th there was this aggression towards Luke, this real, you know, we know it was you type of thing. But then you'd have thought when, when the DNA results came back, because they said, they put a, a, a media statement saying, we're just waiting for the DNA results to come back and confirm our main line of inquiry. They'd made no secret of the fact that Luke was their main line of inquiry. Um, and that, that's one of the disgusting things about this. This was a 14-year-old kid. He was all over the newspapers, on telly, you know, at that age, with the finger pointing at him. So they're waiting for the DNA to come back and that's going to confirm their main line of inquiry until it didn't. And instead of going back to the beginning, to square one, as they said they would do, at that point, they start running around erasing other routes so that this is just going to tighten and tighten on Luke. So the DNA on, the only full DNA profile on Jody or the clothing or anything that was found and identified at the time was on her T-shirt. Full DNA profile male, wasn't Luke. It was her sister's boyfriend's. And instead of getting the boyfriend in and going, want to explain this to us? They hand him an innocent explanation. They go back to him and, and, and her sister and say, is it possible the T-shirt Jodie was wearing was borrowed from you without you knowing? And they go, well, it's possible, yeah. And then, then they start to contrive this ludicrous series of events that would account for this DNA being on the T-shirt. So they said it was first transferred in a washing machine in a house where his clothes are not washed. It was then further transferred by rainwater when it was... When, when the clothes were out in the woodland strip. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's serious. I shouldn't laugh, but really? It's Alice in Wonderland? It's, it's beyond Alice in Wonderland. It's, it's, <sighs> honestly, how, how they made that stick, or, or how, how they got away with it as, as an explanation in the first place, I will never know. Because they're the police, and the police are 100%. They can never be wrong. So they can just make it whatever they want because yeah, the public think, will believe them over a suspect. I, I think as well. So coming back to your your um, 10 points and your expert evidence and your... Expert witnesses to lie. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I said earlier about the, the police haranguing them about DNA on Jodie's bra and saying, you know, it was yours, it was yours, when it wasn't. The expert stood up in court and said the sample that was recovered was a mixed sample that matched in parts, the same parts as Luke Mitchell's profile. Well, it took me a long time to learn about forensics and to, to understand how that works. But essentially, for, for anybody that doesn't know, at, back then it was a 10 marker profile. Each marker consists of Two numbers, and to, to be a full match, all 20 numbers have got to be there and in the same order, exact right order. But many of us have aspects of our DNA profiles in common with each other. So the, the, these parts of the profile that they said matched Luke's profile in the same places. 
I went back through the DNA results, just out of curiosity, to see who else's DNA profiles matched in the same place. And quite bizarre, there's another five or six of them, including the senior investigating officer. <laughs> and yet they tried to claim in court that this was a match to Luke. And although it was um, challenged by Donald Findlay, the, the technicalities, for people that don't understand what how, how DNA profiles work, it, it just sounded like a bit of a cop-out rather than an actual explanation. No, that, that's how it works. Well, decades ago, people didn't understand how her analysis worked. So when an expert witness got up in court and said, with a high degree of scientific probability, this her matches his, mm -hmm. they would just convict people left yeah. and right. And so many innocent people got sent down. And what you're saying now is as laughable as that yeah. to people who understand the subject matter. Yeah. The next one then is hide other suspects. Did we see that in this case? <sighs> the... Channel 5 did a, a documentary at the beginning of February about this case. It's called Murder in a Small Town. And they identified five other people with, with equal amounts or more <laughs> that should have uh, flagged them up as suspects. We know there was only ever one suspect in this case. But these other guys... So, for example, Jodie's cousin and his friend they were on a moped that day messing about on a, a, a an off-road bike basically and we know they went up the path at 5 15 and the bike was seen propped against the wall at 5 15 they're nowhere to be seen they then lie about the time they don't come forward the police have to put out a um an appeal for them this is jody's cousin remember Police put out an appeal for them five days later, day five and day six, they come forward and give them interviews. And by day seven, the morning of day seven, they're eliminated from the inquiry. Before the DNA's back, before any of that, it then turns out they lied about the time they were on the path. And what's bizarre is that they lied to remove themselves from the time that would eventually become the claimed time of the murder, before anybody knew what time Jodie was killed. How old was Jodie's cousin? Uh, I think they were 18. And you said it was Jodie's cousin and his friend? Mm hmm And did they have any history of anything? Oh, yes. Yes, it's, it's not been, um, unfortunately, I can't talk about the actual history. I can only say that there was. Um, the, the, the friend was facing a serious charge himself when he gave evidence against Luke. Are you allowed to say whether it was a violent or a sexual nature? Violent. Oh, dear. Okay. And has that person since been convicted of what he was under investigation for? Not that I know of. Okay. No, I think it just went away. Okay. But, yeah, so so they lied about the time. They then, they then said, um, one of them then said that Jodie's gran told them not to go to the police because they were on the path too early. Again, why? And, and I've got nothing that says the police that then went back to the gran and said, eh, this is what he's telling us. <laughs> is that right? So again, something very obvious you would think that should have been followed up. Nope. What was her relationship like with her cousin? Well, he was the one that was supplying everybody with cannabis. We we also have... Um, there was a second DNA profile found, full DNA profile found at the time, but it wasn't identified until three years later. It was in a condom. Oh, this is... Watching your interview, this is a bizarre thing that yeah. you're going to get into. Yeah. Please give us all the details of the condom. So the, the condom was found 20 yards from Jodie's body and was recorded as having fresh semen, presumably because there was, there was no degradation of the semen. Well, this was found on the day of the incident? Yes. 
With fresh semen, yeah. 20 yards away from the yeah. body. But they couldn't identify... Could they ascertain what time this thing had been disposed of, no. whether it was before or after? No. No. Okay. I think I think part of the problem there was the the time of the 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 claim time of death was was worked backwards towards to make it fit the only time that that Luke could be in the frame because he he was alibied for the rest of the time. The five fifteen p.m. You're saying that that was um, just hypothetical. There's no scientific evidence whatsoever. To say that she was killed at 5.15. When do you think she was killed? I have no idea, but I think it was later than 5.15. Okay. For a number of reasons. The, the, there was cannabis in her system um, that had been ingested within two, two hours prior to her death. And we know she was in school till half past three. She was on the school bus, didn't get home till five past four. Um, so our mum said she didn't smoke at home. So if she then leaves at 10 to 5, we've only got 20 minutes for her to get down the path, smoke a joint, everything that happened. It, it, there's not enough time. And that, that joint really throws everything out because the timing before we discovered that she'd smoked before she was murdered was already really, really tight. Add another five minutes in and the time scale's... It's, it's not possible. So from the autopsy then, could they tell like how high she was from that amount of cannabis, how much she'd smoked? I think all they, all they said was um, the equivalent of a joint, which I thought Just was... Just one joint. Yeah, I thought it was a bit, a bit ambiguous, you know. What's a joint? Yeah. Different things to different people. All right, so this condom is found. There's a, they obviously they extract the DNA from it. Mm -hmm. And then what happens next? For the next three years, nothing. Because it didn't match the, the DNA and it didn't match, well, didn't match Luke, basically. Um, Luke gets convicted to January 2005. And in 2006, the Crown contacts the defence team and says, oh, we've got a match for that semen now. And just had this run through the database. Conveniently for this after the conviction. Other person, and it's, it's a match. A um, guy called James Faulkner. They go, OK, well, yeah, police are going to have to go and have a word with them. So they do. And they say, Mr Faulkner, it's your condom. They say, yeah, yeah. I went down into the Woodland Strip to masturbate because I've got no privacy at home. Why would you take a condom? I don't know. I'm not a man. <laughs> so that that was his that was his story three years later. But then there were elements of the story that he told the police that involved other people, like who he got the condom from, who his friends were at the time. And they went and spoke to them, and they said, "No, that's not the case at all." So. They brought him back in and said, you know, why did you tell us this friend gave you the condoms and that friend? And he goes, I had to say something. And that was the end of it because Luke was convicted. This is so weird. All right, so the only reason I can think of taking the condom to do that would be because you didn't want, like, to leave your DNA anywhere. You were just, like perhaps put it in your pocket and take it home or something. But he's just discarded it and left his DNA where... Or maybe not. Maybe he, maybe he did intend to take it with him and he dropped it and didn't realise. Or he'd used it to have sex with someone. Yeah. It's more likely. Condoms are used to have sex with people, not yeah. to yeah. masturbate with. But they, they, they messed up the, the swabbing of the outside of the condom so they couldn't get uh, forensic data from the outside. But this this guy then <laughs> then says that the following morning when he heard there'd been a girl murdered behind the wall, there's a police cordon, there's police officers everywhere. He goes out behind the police cordon and does the same again. What? Mm -hmm. That's what he told the police. When you say he does the same again, specifically what? Masturbates behind a tree within the police cordon. Into a condom again? Mm-hmm. And just throws it there. Oh no, I think he took that one home. <sighs> this is so weird. 
Bloody hell. But the, the really interesting thing about him, aside from all of that... Have you, like, talked to this guy? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, like, he, for your book or anything, would you, like, wouldn't you have... No, no, he wouldn't speak to me anyway. Okay. But he, he, um, he said that the time he went down the, the back of the wall, um, it was about nine o'clock at night, it was getting grey dark... Yeah. Well, it was broad daylight at nine o'clock at night. It wasn't getting grey dark till about half past ten. But he saw nothing. If if Jody was murdered at 5.15 and he's going down there while it's still light, how didn't he see her? I just don't understand this. This is bizarre. He's got like a bizarre condom masturbation fetish. Mm. Never even heard of that. No. If that is the truth... Um. Wow. So that's just out of this world, isn't it? Any more suspects then? Um. There was one who was a student in a nearby college who turned up the following day with scratches on his face, behaving in a really agitated manner. Couldn't remember where he'd been the night before, couldn't remember what he was doing. So his friend... <clears throat> brought him to the attention of the police, actually took him to the police station and they told him they were busy and they would get back to him. And that that was the end of his involvement. The guy who, who brought him to police attention and brought him to the police station, a guy called Scott Forbes, for years people have called him a liar and a fantasist and said that he was in it to um, make money. He, he, him and Kane were going to go to the papers and make money out of it, yada, yada, yada. Once I got the case papers, they, they said there was no other witnesses to, to what Scott Forbes said. He was the only witness. Once I got the case papers, once again, there were several other statements about this guy behaving strangely. There were several other statements about scratches. Uh, this guy he was known to wear a parka jacket. Another parka jacket. Um, like a flasher or something? No, no, no. He, he was just... Because of the, the thing with Luke supposedly being in a parka jacket and then somebody else turns up in oh, a parka gotcha. jacket. Gotcha. Um, the, he, he appeared in the police files from about day two or day three. And he just his name comes up to be traced and interviewed and potentially eliminated. He would have been eliminated anyway because there was only one suspect. But his name goes from one officer to another, to another, to another, and until eventually it's no further action. And they said they couldn't trace him. That's the reason that he was never interviewed, they couldn't trace him. He lived in the college just 500 yards from the murder scene Remember I said earlier about on the other side of the woodland strip there was a, a big open field. You go straight across that open field and you're into the, the college grounds where he was living at the time. The police went to the college, got the names of the students that were still living there and then didn't go back and interview them. Do you know anything about this person's background, the scratches on the face guy? Again, there are elements in his history of violence and um, drug abuse, various various bits and pieces. Well, we've already ascertained that she was a fighter. Mm. And that these scratches on the face then, let's go over that a bit more. What was the time between the murder and this information coming forward? I, so it would have been, again, we don't know what time the murder was. Okay, um, well, how many, was it hours? Or, I mean, sorry, was it days? Was no, no, it, it, was, it was the following morning. It was the following morning. Yeah. The person who brought this information forward then, what was that person's background or interest in this? Well, he, he was, originally, he, he had a, a criminal past himself, turned his life around completely, um, went on, went to university, trained to be a lawyer, so, you know, completely turned his life around. Um, but, of course, his, his past is always used now to discredit course, his, yeah. his involvement in this case, which is 
awful, but that's what they do. Um, so he was at college at the same time as Mark Keane was at college. And the, the term had broken up and everybody had gone... They lived in during term time and everybody had gone back home. But there were some students were basically had nowhere to go and were still living in the college over the summer. So because Scott knew him, because he was at college with him, and because he turned up with these scratches, Scott was really concerned. He's like, whoa, wait, you know, what on earth is going on here? Um, and then they, they went separate ways because Scott went up to university at Stirling and um, Kane, I think, stayed on for another year in New Battle. Uh, and then when they met up a few years later, that was when Scott found out that the police had never actually spoken to him. And he was like, no, no. He tried to he tried to contact the police. He tried to contact Luke's legal team. Nobody wanted to nobody wanted to know. And that's why he actually went into the the caravan place that Luke's mum ran and said, I have stuff to tell you that nobody wants to hear. And from there, the the first documentary the only other documentary made about this case by mainstream media uh, in 2007 was the Frontline Scotland documentary where this guy gives his statement in the in the documentary saying, this is what I tried to do and nobody was listening. And it's two years after that that I get the case papers and go, it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. So you've just hit on number five of the ten then, which is discredit honest witnesses. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Luke's mum, they accused her of lying, as you know. Yeah, she she lied to cover up from he wasn't there at tea time, she burned his clothes and all of this. Um, but after Jodie was murdered, Luke went for a tattoo. He was underage. So Connie didn't have a problem with it. Yeah, she was like, fine, if he wants a tattoo, let him have a tattoo. And there was a place in Edinburgh um, that tattooed minors and gave them piercings and all sorts. They, they never asked for ID. They never asked for proof of age. They, yeah, they were well known as being the place that younger kids could go because they didn't ask for ID. So they went there. Connie went with them. At trial... They were the tattoo staff were called as basically ambush witnesses. The defense didn't know they were going to call them, and they put them on the stand essentially to say, Do you know, I'm still not entirely sure what they were trying to say because they said that Corinne had lied about Luke's age to get him a tattoo after, after the murder. So I think what they were trying to say was, so if she was going to lie about that, she must have lied about everything else previously. I, I don't know how that works, but that seems to be what they were trying to say. Yep, discredit honest witnesses. That's exactly what they were doing. It's obscene. It's just so obvious what's happened here. And my money so far from what you've told me is on the scratches on the faces guy. Mm, but there are others. Okay, keep going. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> um, One... One person, I have to be really, really careful. Obviously, I will not be pointing fingers and saying he might have done it, he might have done it because... Perhaps leave people's names out. That's doing to them what was done to Luke. Mm -hmm. But let's say in a hypothetical situation where someone is brutally murdered in this fashion and someone within a group relatively close to the victim has all sorts of issues both in terms of violence and mental health and that sort of thing. Should they not, at the very least, be checked out? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if in this case there were someone like that who wasn't checked out, would that seem odd? 
Everything about this case is odd, yeah, including yeah. this. Yeah. And that's where, um, unfortunately, I can, there's only so far I can, I can go with that. I see. But Because of legal restrictions. Yes. So there's even more suspects with um, compelling characteristics, let's say, yeah. that um, are being overlooked because of the, where is it, hide of a suspect's strategy, mm -hmm. which has to come into play in all these cases. Yeah. Oh, boy. All right. So how long was he on remand? He was arrested April 14th, 2004, and the trial began November 2004. So April, May, June, July, August, seven months. But in Scotland, we had something called the 110-day rule which meant once you were charged, they had 110 days to bring you to trial or they had to let you go forever. 227 days, I think, Luke was held before, before trial. It's just another of the rules, the protections. They just went, nah, ignore it. Doesn't his legal counsel like, kind of like protect him from them doing that? They were... Completely backfooted because by then the police and the prosecution had had nine and a half months to build a case against Luke, whilst there was no legal team. So the legal team comes in, if they've only got 110 days to build a defence against nine and a half months of case building, you've then got the, the real difficulty of how, how can they do that? You know, and, and the amount of rubbish that was in the case files quite deliberately, I think, because the defence would still have had to plough through all of that, even though it's rubbish, to, to find out what was the important stuff. So I think the 110 days was, was way too tight for them. Um, but at the same time, there were things like the, the defence asked for the trial to be moved out of Edinburgh because the massive, massive publicity, I mean, it was relentless from start to finish, he was in the papers the whole time. So the defence said he can't get a fair trial in Edinburgh. And the judge says, yes, he can. We'll just tell people to put everything they read in the newspapers out of their minds and that'll sort it. <laughs> oh, boy. And I know what's going to happen now because court is theatre. Mm -hmm. In my case, the ecstasy importation case... I went to court every month, I think, for the run period, about 26 months. My lawyer said I was a child, protege, stock market trader, gone, you know, wild. And um, the prosecutor said I was the Antichrist. And I'm listening to both of them, and I'm thinking, <laughs> can I just say something here? Because <laughs> the truth is, like, in the middle. Um, but it's not... The truth is irrelevant. That's what I learned. The truth is completely irrelevant. It is theatre. And whoever has the most money puts on the best theatre show. I mentioned Ray Crone, Snaggletooth Killer. They gave him $5,000 to defend himself. They spent millions showing that he committed a murder that he hadn't committed. Expert witnesses were getting $50,000 a pop, a piece, to say whatever the state wanted them to say. So... When there's not a shred of physical evidence to support a murder, what do they do? The theatre show focuses on another one of the rules of the, out of the ten, creating emotional reactions. So they focus on the gruesome nature of the crime. They have the photos, the reenactments, the experts come in and describe the horror and the trauma. I'm not detracting from that. It's absolutely obscene what happened to this woman, but it's equally obscene to pin it on an innocent person. And I guarantee, I don't know why I'm at the trial, but I'm guaranteeing Sandra is going to tell us something of this nature because it is a formula they use to convict innocent people, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Right, right from the beginning, the main witnesses were Jodie's family members. And of course they were, because 
like you say, that emotional response, who who wouldn't be in sympathy with a family who, whose daughter had been so so brutally murdered? But some of the things about that, um, Jodie's mum took the stand and said Jodie had been grounded right up till that afternoon and she just decided that afternoon at half past four to lift the grounding and tell Jodie she could go out whenever she wanted. And that, that was that was portrayed really emotionally, you know, and I just said to her, that's you, you can go out any time you like. And, and she texted Luke and she was all happy and except that all the statements prior to that, she wasn't grounded. She and couldn't have been grounded if she had scored weed. Mm. Yeah, Unless she'd bought it off the cousin's friend. Well, we also know she was she was with Luke the day before and the day before that as well. So the sun the Saturday and the Sunday, she was killed on the Monday night. So she wasn't grounded either of those days. So she wasn't grounded. She wasn't also, grounded. also her sister and her gran both said she wasn't grounded. She had been grounded, but it had it had petered out. And what was the basis she'd been grounded for? Originally skipping school and smoking. But once again, and, and this is you'll have come across this as well, in order to, to make things more emotive, they managed to get her mum to change the focus on why she was grounded from skipping school and smoking to smoking and having sex. Even though she'd never say she had a problem with having sex, but they needed the sex and the drugs interlinked for the, the shock horror effect of this 14-year-old kid who was having sex and dealing drugs and into Satanism. And, and they, just, they just... I mean, it's so easy to do. You know, first mum says she was she was grounded for skipping school and smoking weed, and they go back to her and say, "Now, when, when did it, when did you say Jodie started having sex? What what? How was that connected to her being banned for her cousin's house?" And and suddenly you have this change to it being the smoking and the sex rather than the skipping school. So Luke has corrupted her. That's what they That's, were implying. Uh, yeah. Likewise, all of them. When they gave their, their evidence, um, so so our our mum, our gran, our sister, our sister's boyfriend and the cousin, they all gave the impression that Jodie didn't smoke until she met Luke. And we know she did. How? Because all of them said she smoked before she met Luke. So It just changed, they changed over time. Once the they're on the, the stand. To fit the false narrative. Yeah. And, and the cousin... The cousin that, that supplied everybody um, admitted in his statements that, that he supplied Jodie with cannabis. I did I did forget to mention that the cousin and Jodie's brother were in Jodie's mum's house that day with a nine bar. But Luke's the supplier. That so, never came out of trial either. That so was if you never mentioned. so if you if you get interviewed by the police. And it's you change your your testimony. It's perjury if it doesn't suit the narrative. Um, but if you're changing it to help the narrative, you don't get charged with lying to the police in the very beginning or mm -hmm. anything. You just get put in front of a jury because you have been cultivated and fact fed to say these things. Absolutely, Absolutely. coached coached every step of the way. Really, now, don't say this. Don't mention that. This is. This is what you're looking for. This is what you're going to say. And and I think it's maybe not quite as blatant as that, but that is what they're doing. You know, Coaching, are, yeah. Are you sure that's what the dog did? Are you sure the dog actually reacted at all? No. Is it possible that maybe he didn't go past the V until they're saying, yeah, you're right, he didn't go past the V, the dog didn't react, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah, he, he got her into weed, you know. She, she never touched it before him. All your statements say she did. So in in the lead up to trial then, does Luke's mum still have faith in the justice system? Yeah. She thinks he's going to get freed. Well, by then, by then, 
they'd kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, the cops, they'd lost it. They they were going their own way and, you know, they, they, they'd gone after the wrong person. It was just a complete mess. But the courts would sort it out. Oh, God. And in just about every case I've worked on in the last 18 years, it's been the same. The families have believed that the truth would come out at trial. And, and what you were saying earlier, you know, it's not about truth. It's theatre. You can't, you cannot get these people to accept that it's not about truth. They have to, they have to ex experience it themselves, which is awful. But they can't, they, they can't process that truth doesn't matter here because they need the trial to get to the truth, to make the thing stop. So, so can you can you estimate then how much the authorities spent on their theatre show? Is, was it millions of pounds? It has to be millions. It has to have been. They they built, <laughs> they, they got another building and they built a reconstruction of the wall with the V-point and took the jury there to demonstrate this walking past the V and walking back and, and all of that. I mean, that in itself would have cost tens of thousands of pounds to support a narrative that nobody ever said happened. Like, so the authorities are spending millions on their theatre show. How much money did Luke have available for his theatre show? It's not money available, if you know what I mean. Like, they didn't have like anything. The, the legal aid system is simply Luke gets assigned a lawyer and then the lawyer applies for legal aid for the various bits and pieces that he needs to do. So, for example, the... Um, Cell site evidence, cell site evidence, cell site analysis wasn't done. Well, they told us it wasn't done. So the defence applied for legal aid funding to get cell site analysis done to see phone movement, essentially, who went, where, when, and in what direction. And the legal aid board came back and said, your expert's too expensive. Go and find somebody cheaper. So it's that sort of thing, you know, uh, rather than being given an amount, it's, it's you can apply for that, but you might not get it. And you can apply for that, but no, nah, we're not going to give you that either. So this is like a person with no money mm -hmm. trying to go up against someone like Andrew Lloyd Webber mm -hmm. in terms of theatre performance. The outcome is obvious. And then... The next, um, another one of the ten, I don't know if it's happened in this case, is rigging the jury, having, you know, like ex-cops or family members related to the cops or stuff like that on the jury. Have you got anything? We don't know. You don't know. And, and obviously we're not allowed to go looking for jurors to find out. Right. But what we do know is when... When the jury retired on the, the Thursday night, uh, they'd, they'd gone out at lunchtime to start their deliberations and they came back at about half past three and said, we're nowhere near, we're nowhere near a, a um, verdict. And the judge said, well, you know, there used to be a time where we put people up in hotels so that they can't, they can't be influenced and nobody else can get to them and yada, yada. But I don't see there being any risk of that in this case and sent them home. They came back in the following morning, and within an hour, an hour, said they had a verdict. When they brought them back in, one of the jurors gave a thumbs up to Jodie's family. So, um, so it was manipulated I, I think in some way. Essentially, the the whole jury was rigged anyway because of the, you know, year and a half of utterly relentless media coverage that was intended to leave nobody in any doubt whatsoever. It was him. So I suppose you don't really need to, to rig it specifically if you've done that for long enough and then picked local people as your jurors. But yeah, he came out and gave a thumbs up to the family. Oh dear. What was his mum's and his reaction then when the conviction came down? Total disbelief. Total, total disbelief. Um, Corinne often says she she thought 
she'd just not heard the word not. Because it would not compute that they'd said guilty instead of not guilty. Um, they also thought, as did I, that's how naive I was back then, it'd be sorted out within a year. We'd get an appeal, they'd realise it was all a mistake, and he'd be home within a year. Yeah. 18 years in June. Oh and still God. counting. Oh my God. And Gordon Buchan was here at the beginning of the week, who you're familiar with, mm -hmm. part of the Wolf Pack in Scotland. And he's 100% behind Luke Mitchell. And he said that Luke Mitchell did have a hard time in the very beginning and refused to be separated from the general population, protesting his innocence. <clears throat> and now the prisoners know he's fully innocent and nobody gives him a hard time. Yeah, it, it's... Over the years, I mean, obviously in the early days, especially because he was in the young offenders place where... where Gladiator school. Yeah, yeah. Um, but over time, I think the first documentary and then the books and then the podcasts and then the big documentary, over time, it's been a few more people and a few more people can wait. Hang on. Tell me that again. No, that can't be right. You know, he 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 couldn't have done it in that time scale. He couldn't have done it and left no DNA and all of that sort of thing. But gradually, 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 the the prison staff themselves have gone. Nah, nah. This is there's something wrong here. And and really, a lot of them, or quite a few of them, from the early days, were saying that. So, um, how? When when you've got a situation like that, you can't get back to the court of appeal because now we have to go to the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission. You only get one shot at appeal now, and then it's got to go to the commission. The commission already turned down our previous application. So this was a, a circumstantial case, as you know, and the judge explained that in, or it might have been the prosecutor, that in a circumstantial case, you have all these bits of evidence that would not be strong enough in their own right to convict somebody. But when you link them all together, the weight of them all together is what gives the case its strength. So, so the theory goes. So when we went to the commission, we, t we knocked out different bits of this cir circumstantial case. So the two witnesses, th there was a witness who said she saw a couple at the East House's end of the path and two witnesses who said they saw a guy at the new battle end of the path. So that's Jodie's end, Luke's end. The one that said she saw the couple, she was supposed to be a, an independent witness. Her brother-in-law was a close friend of... Jodie's family, so not that independent. But the two at the other end went past in a car, saw a youth standing against a gate, and and that's kind of it. They said he was wearing a parka jacket, and that's why I mentioned Mark Kane and his parka jacket. They, according to Mark Kane's own um, evidence, he was seen running on the New Battle Road that night. So these, these two these two women could very possibly have seen Mark Kane on his way to get his, his cans of beer and not look. So when we went to the commission and said, you know, there's a possibility. That's a mistaken identity and it wasn't Luke at all. It was Mark Kane. They came back and said, um, it's irrelevant because Mr. Kane was never a suspect. Uh, try, trying to work out the, the connection there. It's Kafkaesque, isn't it? But then the, all the other bits that they agreed with us where things had gone wrong. So um, the stocky man that was seen following Jody just after she, she left home had apparently never been identified. In all these years, he'd never been identified. The SCCRC come back and say, oh yeah, actually, 10 weeks after the murder, he was. But it was never it was never released to the defence. We're like, okay, disclosure failing. That's the next one then, hide exculpatory yeah. evidence. Yeah. 
is number seven. Exculpatory evidence is if the prosecutor comes across something that helps the defense, they have to give it to the defense. But they come up with convenient ways to hide these things. Mm -hmm. Yep. So who reported the stocky man? Um, two independent witnesses, one of whom knew Jodie, said they saw Jodie and this stocky man following closely behind her on the road just outside her house. Um, one of those witnesses then came back and said she thought she knew who he was. She thought she'd seen him again on some television footage amongst a group of look males who looked very similar. And she picked this particular one out and she said, that's him. And that was never released to the defence. The In 2012-13, when the, the SCCRC were doing their, their review, they went to Donald Findlay and said, well, you know, if that had been released at the time, w would it have been of significance? Would you have used it? And Donald Finlay quite rightly said, um, I can't tell you what my strategy would have been on the basis of something I didn't have. You know? <laughs> I don't know what my strategy would have been had I had it. Um, but they decided that the witness's recall in 2014 was better than a recall at the time and that no harm had been done. So th the point I was getting to there is a, a st circumstantial case, in order for a cir circumstantial case to be strong enough, all these things need to be linked together. To get through the commission, to get back to appeal, you would imagine the same thing. If they knock out one, two, three, four, five, six, they may not individually be enough to suggest on their own that there's been a miscarriage of justice. But if you take them all together in the same way that you do for a prosecution, then that should be strong enough to say, hang on, there's far too much going wrong here. Nope. They don't add them together. Well, not when it's in your favour. Yep. Convict at all costs, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so you already brought up something that I was going to ask about. Now, this happened in 2005. 2003. Oh, sorry, 2003. And what was cell phone technology like back then? What could they get from, like, the pings on the cell towers and what was on people's phones in the area? And what, yeah. what, what, pattern, what, what patterns uh, did, you know, were revealed from that data? We didn't get the data. You didn't get any data? No. You see... They told us that the prosecution, the police hadn't gone for cell site analysis, cell site data, because uh, the technology wasn't advanced enough or something like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't until I saw the papers and went, wait a minute, the defence couldn't just randomly ask for, for cell site analysis. They could only ask for money for a second opinion, which means there has to have been cell site analysis but anyway, um, I, I checked later, I contacted a, a cell site expert and he said, that's absolute rubbish. Of course they could have got it. That, that you know, the, the um, technology was well advanced enough to get that. Same with, with the texts that were never retrieved. And they said, oh, they couldn't get them back. And my cell site, my cell phone expert says, it's a good so that's just more suppression of exculpatory evidence mm -hmm. then, just you know, yep. using one excuse or another to not provide anything that's going to show anything outside of the false narrative. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. My God. All right, so he goes to trial, loses, and then is there an immediate appeal? He was convicted... January 2005, and we didn't get to appeal until 2008. So yeah, the appeals do take long, to, long, long yeah. amounts of time. Again, the... the and, and by now, as his family woke up to the reality of the situation, fired his lawyer and brought in someone <laughs> who's competent? No, they, they went with the same lawyer okay. to appeal. Okay. And that, that's an interesting one, actually, because they didn't... Two things... They didn't choose his legal team. 
state did. It was it was given to them is the first thing. And they didn't know you could sack them. Mm. They thought because that's who had been allocated to them, they had to stay with them. It's all one little click. You know, they're battling out in the courtroom, but they're having tea and biscuits after the bloody... Yeah. At the end of the day, aren't they? Yeah. No, I'm not ah, sure yeah, it's yeah, tea yeah. and biscuits either. <laughs> 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 All right, so what happens on this appeal that happens three years later? What grounds was the appeal based on and what was the ruling? Um, the, there was an, a number of grounds. I think there was eight areas or grounds of appeal. Um, things like the trial shouldn't have been held in Edinburgh. Um, the cherry-picking of the Section 14 interview to um, influence the jury. The use of evidence from Luke's brother that was, again, elicited in the same way as, as Luke's. They, they arrested him, dragged him out of his car, spread him out in the road, um, bundled him off in a police car, no lawyer, for allegedly attempting to pervert the course of justice. You know, it's not like he was, he was I don't know, an armed robber or something. Um, there was also the, the Keane and Faulkner so condom man and scratches man, because they'd come to the defence's attention after the conviction. And they just went through each one and essentially just made up an excuse. So the, one of them was Andrina Bryson sighting. So this is the lady that, that saw the couple at Jodie's end of the path. And she described two people in completely different clothing to what, um, Luke and Jodie were wearing that night. She was driving around Sharp Bend with two kids in the car. The guy was in the lane. The girl was on the pavement with her back to her. She never saw their faces, but this is... She eventually identifies Luke from a spread of photographs that was really, really leading, and then fails to identify him in court. So this has raised appeal like that that whole identification process was outrageous and, and no identity parade was ever heard, ever held. So really, that that identification shouldn't have been relied upon. And they came back with, well, the jury were entitled to infer that the girl could have been Jodie. Beyond reasonable doubt. Could have been. And upheld that ground of appeal. The one with the the semen in the condom, the the crown guy stood up and said it was no match whatsoever. The DNA was no match whatsoever. Yeah, he obviously forgot that it was the crown that told the defence about the match in the first place. So again, how how did he ever get away with saying? It was no match whatsoever, when it clearly was. So they went through each of the grounds of appeal and did stupid things like that. You know, well, it could have been Jodie. They were entitled to infer that. Uh, the evidence from the Section 14 interview. Now, remember, this This is a lad who's just turned 15, locked in a room with three really experienced cops. And the judges say, well, yep, their behaviour was outrageous and to be deplored. Police officers behaving like that, very, very naughty boys. But Luke Mitchell gave as good as he got and he didn't confess. And upheld it. Oh, the system has to protect itself. It, it's the why. I mean, I get that the system has to protect itself, but... And I always go back to the Rachel and the Kell case, where the police went after Colin Stagg and he was the wrong guy. But while they're fixated on him, the real guy's gone off and murdered um, Samantha and Jasmine Bissett. Horrific murders. And the system keeps going, we're not listening. We're not listening. We won't yeah, admit so, any so, wrongdoing. So let's, let's explore that then. So my theories as to why they commit to a conviction and stick with it even in the face of evidence against it. One of them is that their careers are on the line, and the other is that they have 
told the family members we've got the person and they can't lose face with yeah. the family because if they have to then turn around and say, we were wrong, yeah. there's another guy out there who's committing more crimes. It, it, it's just psychologically, it's something they can't accept. So you've got the careerists, you've got people who can't, uh, refuse, you know, psychologically to to um, accept that for the family's sake, and then you've got psychopaths who work in the system anyway, who yeah. are just in it for themselves because millions were spent on this it, by the looks of it, and that went into the pockets of all of those th theatre performance actors and experts and whatever who just are absolute parasites and vampires feeding off cases like this it's yeah. taxpayers money is like a feeding trough yeah and if they can get the schnozzies in there they, they'll just suck the life out of it so if they're proven wrong they lose access to that feeding trough mm -hmm. so that's got to be protected at all costs so you've got the, the the careerists you've got the people who've committed to the family that they've got the right guy you've got um all the money at stake if if um if these people are proven wrong, that the, the, you know, they lose access to the contracts, because th those theatre actors are brought in. This is not just one a one-time show. These shows are going on all over the country all yeah. the time, and expert witnesses are just flown around places in America and in, in this country. They probably go around the country, and they, they, it's like bam, bam, bam. Just the amount of money they're making—it's obscene. So. Could you give me your thoughts on all those points, please? You, yeah, there is another one um, as well, and that is this this pressure on. I mean, it, it's it's to solve a crime. Co convict? No, they don't want to solve the crime. They don't care about solving the crime. I mean, to solve the yeah. crime, the, so the, the public's idea, happy. We've got the guy fast. Yeah, yeah. Ah, look how good we are. The idea that they would actually spend all that money, get to the end, and go, oh well. We don't have anybody. We did an investigation, but it didn't lead us to anybody. Not a chance. That is not... They, they simply... Even even if that was actually what would happen if they did it properly, it's not going to happen. They're not going to do it. Because, like you say, there's, there's this... And this whole police culture of we know, and we know what we know, because our gut instincts and, you know, 50 years' experience, and I can tell you I knew straight away. How did you know straight away? So, So there's that element of, like, Ego. Ego. In in a lot of ways, it, it, it's a it's is it overconfidence or is it arrogance? I'm not quite sure, but that sense of we know better than Joe Ordinary. We're we're you know we have special skills in this department, and that's why we're good cops. And no, you're just fitting people up with whatever you can pull together. But I do think that. I do think that that need to get to the conviction, get the glory, and and in in this case, you know, the the senior investigating officer, this was his, this was his show trial swan song. He was getting ready to retire, all of that. So yeah, and all of the above, because you're right, the amount of money, and and interestingly, at the same time. They're cutting legal aid year on year. They're cutting funding to the SCCRC year on year, which means the people setting these up are the ones with access to the unlimited funds. And anybody that might be able to somehow slow it down or, or derail it, the funding's just disappearing. Yep, unless you've got the money of an OJ Simpson, mm. you can't fight back in a situation like this. So, you know, you said earlier on that even people who were against Luke have now woken up. Yes. What's the attitude of the family of Jody? And, you know, my heart goes out to them. This is not about um, putting down what you've been through by going against Luke because I see the family members as being hoodwinked by a corrupt system and I understand you would want this evil bastard nailed as soon as possible and perhaps some kind of relief and closure you would have felt upon hearing from the trusted authorities that we've got the guy so 
my hope is that as time has passed, perhaps it could be looked at in the context of the points that we've raised today because we are trying to get to the bottom of it in a case where there's no physical evidence at all it is just so easy for the authorities to make up any old false narrative and then just have you know the expert witnesses come in have the false witnesses um, lie hide the other suspects discredit honest witnesses rig the jury hide exculpatory evidence this is an absolute formula I've seen over and over again. And I feel in this case that Luke, um, you know, God bless him, needs to be getting out after he's in his, he's in his 30s. He's got his whole life ahead of him. He has not cowed down in prison. He has protested his innocence. He has stood up to the other prisoners. And the prison population believe he's innocent. So many people in Scotland believe he's innocent. The only people who don't are the people who stand to lose so much because they've got now a vested interest to keep this conviction upheld. And that is absolutely horrific to think that the person who did this is possibly out there and could potentially commit more crimes may have already committed more crimes. So it's in the interest of justice, honesty, and integrity that this gets examined in a new light. So that's, you know, that's what I, I would convey. That's what I'm trying to convey to the family members. It needs to be looked at in a completely new light, away from all of these vested interests who uh, are never going to let this guy out. And if he is innocent, Jody is obviously looking down thinking, what the hell, you know. Mm -hmm. I was with him and um, it's, it's like a double crime really, isn't it? It's so sad. Do you have anything to add to that, Sandra? That's, you know, I've, I've been saying since the beginning, I do this as much for justice for Jody as I do for justice for Luke. Um, anybody that thinks I'm disrespecting Jodie's memory by suggesting that the wrong person was convicted. You know, absolutely not. It's it's not justice for Jodie. It's not. And what we've been calling for is an independent review of the case. So take the lot and put it before completely independent people. And that way, if Luke did it, and they find the evidence, so be it. Everybody will know. And if he didn't do it, and they find the evidence, we need to start looking for who did. Um, they say, you know, they can't interfere with the justice system and politicians can't get involved. How did we get the Criminal Cases Review Commissions in the first place? Yeah, politicians. And they did an independent review for the Hillsborough families as rightly they should have done. So it can be done. It can be done. And with enough support and enough pressure behind this case, it will be done. And the pressure is coming. There are plans afoot to really make this a big issue. And thanks to what Sandra's doing, Johnny Boy Steele and the people of Scotland who are campaigning and putting up the posters and not letting this get off the public eye. The thing with politicians is, many of them, the priority is votes and public opinion. And if this becomes an issue whereby the votes are on the line, then that's hitting them right in the guts and they will act on it. So when public pressure rises to boiling point, the politicians will be forced to act. So that's what we need to do. We need to get this case to boiling point, whereby something has to be done. 
because it's just so sad, almost 20 years now, for Luke to be in there. Fortunately, he was so young when he got arrested, he still has prime years of his life left. If we can get him out, he's not going to be a really old man. And we've got, you know, certain media now, Murder in a Small Town. Did you say that was Channel 4? Channel 5. 5. It's still available on their, their watch again. I'm going to watch this. Thing, yeah. And did you say there was an earlier programme about it as well? Yeah, that's that's no longer available. It, was, was that one sympathetic? Yeah, reasonably. Reasonably. It, it was BBC, so they had to... Yeah. They had to be careful about being too supportive. But yeah. Um, yeah. So that was um, Luke Mitchell, the devil's own question mark, was what it was called. Um, it was taken down. It was 2007 it went out. So, you know, it disappeared. But I think somebody said there was a link to it on YouTube somewhere. So it might still it might still be there. What was it called again? Uh, Luke Mitchell, the devil's own. Luke Mitchell, right, we'll put all these links in the description box. Luke yeah. Mitchell, The Devil's Own. Is your um, book available as an audio book? It's not at the minute. Um, I had intended to have it available as an audio book. Um, and then the documentary happened and I ran out of time. Well, I've got a publishing company. If you want me to do it as an audio book for you, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, are you in contact with Luke and his family? Yes. And what's the? how are their spirits holding up? Um... His mum has been very ill. Um, How old is she now? 62. And this has probably really wore her down. Oh, yeah. Um, you'll see in the documentary, she was living in a tin shed. Oh, my Lost God. Lost everything. Living in a tin shed. So her health has really suffered. Oh, my she, God. She's back on the mend now, but obviously that's going to take its toll on top yeah. of everything else. Um, so Luke... Obviously, is is delighted at the amount of support. I think it's hard for him to get his head around those numbers um, after all these years. Obviously, there's the bit of him that's waiting for it all to go away again because he's never had this this level of support. Would you say that momentum is increasing? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll be speaking to to Luke next week. We have a couple of a couple of um, routes that I we're going to be able to take but obviously that's always always got to be done with Luke's permission so I follow him up out here and then I call him and say right here's what we've got what do you think so yeah and and you know there are there may not be many routes left open to us but there are some and we'll, we'll pursue every one of them and what's his legal counsel now has he got different people doesn't helping have him? anybody at the minute because there are no live proceedings because there are no live proceedings what does that mean well, there's, there's nothing going on. Oh, I see. He's got no legal action yeah. necessary to be taken at this yeah. point. So, what would the next uh, step be? Um, would like some new evidence have to come to light, or something that could open this up? Yeah. So, so new evidence, and of course, the definition of new evidence—that which was not, or could not reasonably have been available to the defence or to the trial at the time. So, some of the things. And again, I need to be a bit careful. Some of the things that we now know would constitute new evidence. We just need to get them in a format that's acceptable to go to the Commission. The, the problem with this, this whole thing is we need to draw it all together. We then need to put the application into the Commission. And we then need, they then need to do their whole um, review and decide whether to send it back to the Court of Appeal or not. Now, the last one took over two years. And this has got to be done by a highly professional lawyer, and it's going to cost money, isn't it? Yeah. Is is there, like, a donation uh, thing for Luke or anything like that set up? We're not allowed to raise funds for a convicted prisoner. Um, I, do you have, like, a website whereby people who work in the legal profession could come forward and perhaps um, do pro bono work on this? We don't have a website. Um, I have been trying to contact lawyers and, and legal experts. Uh, at the minute, I think because it's so high profile, there's there's nobody getting back to me. It's almost like, uh oh, who's going to be the one that puts their neck on the line for this one? I'm sure someone out there watching this. Please. Um, 
may just have that attitude of, well, I would be the one to put my neck on this yeah. and, and get this get this situation fixed. And there's so much suffering going on. The, the mom, Luke, the family members, the possibility of another murder out there. If someone could step up and fix this from the legal community, what an absolute hero you would be. Yeah, and I, I'm easy to find. I'm easy to find. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. Um, all, all your links are going to be below this video. Yeah, I'm easy to find. Yeah. So just anybody that that has the expertise and they'd have to have the expertise. Yeah. Um, are there organisations who specialise in this? Not in Scotland. Not not like Am Amnesty International, things like that? No. Um, human rights places, no human rights? No, it, it's... It's a difficult one because Scots law is is an entirely separate creature to, is to English law. Yeah, so absolutely. all those charities out of London couldn't be of any use. No, that's it's, terrible. It's, it's it's a different it's a different system. Are the charities um, in like Edinburgh that do, that specialise in this this stuff? I've never come across anything in all these years that that would be able to that would be able to help. Bloody hell! Which is why I had to learn. How to do it myself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From from alternative therapist to how does this work? How does that work? Good Where grief. does that go? But, yeah. And if you weren't in his corner, do you think that a lot of the attention to it now would never have happened, and it, he would have just been forgotten? Unless another person like me had come along. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think. I don't. The, the family didn't know. They didn't know how to deal with this. Yeah. Most families don't. And I think it's only because I was that one step removed. I didn't know any of them mm -hmm. in the early stages. So I could do this from the outside without the emotional <sighs> devastation yeah. of what was going on. Um, and I, I think even, even, even with families that, that do try to fight on their own, like not having anybody on the outside, it's quite often years before they, they get to the point where they go, oh, right, we're going to have to fight this now. Yeah. Because they wait for so long. They keep thinking, mm -hmm. somebody's coming, somebody's coming. Yeah. The rescue's happening, the rescue's happening. Until the point where they go, oh, God, no. It's not mm -hmm. happening. They're not coming. And then they have to start this. How does it... And, I, and I've, seen, I've seen as well families going down routes that... It looks like the obvious route to take, but it's not. It won't work. Yeah. And and saying to people, please don't do that. Don't put all your energy into that because in two years' time you're going to come back to me and say that didn't work and we've yeah. just wasted another it's two be years. Done, done right and professionally. Yeah. 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 Is there anything I've missed out that you would like to say? Oh yeah, there's still loads about the case that um, there's something when I was talking about the 110 day rule. Um, we're talking about theatre and we're talking about their own rules and everything. Yeah. Luke was 15 at the time of the Section 14 interview. And they waited until, so that was the August, they waited until mid-April to arrest him. So, is it ever really? Eight and a half months. Now, the 110 days from that point ended about a week after Luke turned 16, which meant he could be tried as an adult. Mm. So the reason they waited so long to arrest him was so that he could be tried as an adult. Wow. And not a child. Wow. How evil is that? Oh, it takes a special kind of wicked Yeah. To to think that one through. In the introduction, I said that you'd been harassed by the police. In your own words, can you say what happened? It, it's not just the police that I was harassed by. Um, Jodie's brother turned up at my house and threatened to kill me. Um, so, you know, the, the local hostility was horrendous and people would shout at me in the street. I was spat on, I was pushed, I was, you know. It, it was a dangerous, dangerous stance to take back then. Um in the early days, it was not just the police. And in actual fact, the, the police were probably safer because they were more predictable. 
Yeah, <laughs> you knew what was coming when it, when you saw the car behind you or, or whatever. Whereas when it's just ordinary members of the public, you have no idea who's friend, who's foe. You know, it, it was. I wasn't. I wasn't scared by it because I understood it. I understood why they believed that. Um, I was more worried that, that people would target my girls, that, that people would find out that I was their mum and go for them. Um, but yeah, just the, the continual harassment with the police, you know, stopped in the car, where are you going, where have you been? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, one of them, I said earlier, um, they, they stopped me. And, and this was a bit worrying, actually, because I had the girls in the car and it was on... A stretch of road where there's uh, houses and buildings, and and then it comes in a, a bit where there's nothing. Where did this? Where did they stop me? On the blind bend. Yeah, yeah. And oh, it was just rubbish. You know, it move the car forward, move the car back. They're looking underneath. I'm like, what are you doing? Um, and he, he said, uh, you've got an intermittent brake light fault. I was like. How do you know I only use my brakes intermittently? <laughs> it's like, where did that come from? Yeah. Um, but yeah, especially if it was if I'd been to the prison or was coming back from the prison, you could just about guarantee it that, yeah, at some stage on one of those journeys, I would get pulled. What's it like visiting him in the prison? I'd f- visiting anybody in prison is just horrendous. It's... it's It's false because it has to be. Everybody plays the part because nobody's going to sit and talk about the reality. You can't. So, and of course, we locked down. Um, we were doing, we were doing video camera visits. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not, but no prison prison visits. God, I feel for the families. I feel you, for the families. Have you visited him over the years of the, for the entirety of it? Uh, no, there was a period after the commission um, gave the statement of reasons and said they weren't referring it back. We had a step back from the case for about a year. Um, I, just, I just didn't think I had anything more to give to it. And I didn't want to... I didn't want to be in the way and the case was handed over to the Miscarriage Justice Organisation in Scotland um, and they, they called me up and said we can't we can't do it we don't know what we're doing can you help us so that was me kind of back in but from a distance now sort of behind an organisation if you like um, and that just in the end that just didn't work out um, and the boxes all came back to me and they're all you know, piled up in my office and that's just back into how it was before. So um, by the time we had the, started making the film and lockdown, it was it was on to video visits from that point. So, yeah, there was that bit in the middle where I didn't I didn't visit because it, I just I was stepping back from it. And he's become a man, hasn't he? He's grown from a teenager yeah. into, as a man in prison. How have you seen him change over the years, you know, especially in terms of his morale? Do you know, he's he's a calm, steady guy. And that calm steadiness has has been there right through, wow. right from the beginning. Wow. He's, he's got a brilliant sense of humour. And I think, so has Corinne, and I think that has served them better than anything good, the, good the ability to, to laugh at you know things that are really not funny but it's what else mechanism. are you going to do with them yeah so so yeah his there, there's just this sort of stoic we'll get there we'll get there just keep going yeah yeah just keep at it so yeah i think he's definitely going to get the view in his corner all right, so, you know, people, there's like the old cliches, you know, everybody's bloody saying they're innocent in prison, but they're all guilty. The boyfriend's always the one who does yeah. it, things like that. 
floating around. And these are knee-jerk reactions and that the media capitalizes on, that the authorities capitalize on. But when you think about this at a deeper level, and, you know, I came in here today knowing the 10 things that the authorities used to frame innocent people, didn't know what Sandra was going to say. But, and I'm emphasizing this over and over again because I want people to see that it is an absolute formula. Whatever the motivations are of the perpetrators of the formula, the theater actors, the police, you know, there's, there's various motives. Whatever they are, the formula is the same. We got false witnesses were procured, expert witnesses lied, emotional reactions were created, other suspects were hid, honest witnesses were discredited, jury was probably rigged, exculpatory evidence was hid, and it's all right there. It's all right there. I'm 100% convinced this kid didn't commit this crime. There's no way he could have hid it. To do the things they said he did to Jody, there's no way he could have hid it. His DNA would have been properly on her. Her DNA would have been properly on his clothes. Her blood would have been properly on his clothes. These are not sophisticated murderers who go home and, you know, um, burn all their clothes and take a shower. These are not mafia people. The police saying that his mum bloody well burnt his clothes. That's what the mafia does. These are not mafia people. These are just normal people. That is absolutely ludicrous. So, I'm hoping that people who've watched this can see the sense of how this formula works. And I'm hoping that perhaps there are people out there who are in the legal community or in organisations who could step in because he needs the resources to go up against the millions of the state. Like I said, it's theatre. If he's never going to have any professional help or resources to put on his own theatre show, he's not going to get out of this situation. And I'm not here to bash the police. We work with the police. We've had multiple ex-cops on the podcast that we work with, ongoing, who are members, some of them are members of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Drug Prohibition. Which is another factor, you know, if drugs weren't illegal, she wouldn't be running around hiding, you know, smoking weed. And this perhaps would never would have happened either. Oh, the black market in drugs has got a factor to play in this too. Um, maybe she had to go and get and score from her drugs from somebody who turned around and murdered her and did this. That could be a possibility as well. If drugs were legal, that 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 person would have been he wouldn't have had a job he wouldn't be selling drugs the government would have complete control of it so we're not bashing police here you know we need the police there are many good people working in the police force and they tell us the orders come down from the top we did join to do certain things but hey you know our, our hands are tied and there's many many flaws in the system and the worst kind of flaws in the system create situations like this. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. You know, I did six years for importing ecstasy into America. I was fully guilty and I did my time. And to do almost 20 years as an innocent person, I can't imagine. After 10 years, I, I was thinking I would have gone insane. And to hear from Sandra how he's, he's got this stoic spirit and he's cracking jokes and he's holding, holding him, his head high even though he's been accused and convicted of killing a teenage, a teenage female which you know the prisoners would try and kill you if they believed you had done that. And for the prison population to understand that he's not done that and to allow him to hold his head up high says a lot right there to me about his innocence as well. So, you know, Sandra's on a mission. I'm sure she's going to do many more interviews. The book's out there. Hopefully we can get the audio book out as well. And more and more people are going to be aware and it's going to be raised to that boiling point that I mentioned earlier. But if you are in the legal community or 
part of some human rights organization or charity, please, please reach out to Sandra. Um, what is your preferred method of people contacting you? Um, I have the, I have the, um, email address as well if, if you're leaving links but i can put whatever you want in the description okay. box and put your email okay. i can put your website whatever um, you've got but you'll get you'll get me on facebook linkedin twitter email all of them yeah yeah all of those links then will be in the description box below the video can i can i just say yeah as well, please um, please yeah the the idea that that luke was sentenced to 20 years for this murder a lot of people don't understand that was 20 years minimum. He's actually sentenced without limit of time. So IPP, is it like that? Sort of, yeah. It's, it's, um, it, in this case, it was just, you know, um, uh, there is no time limit. End of. And if you're protesting your innocence, thereby, if you are convicted of murder, you are not showing remorse, so we're never going to let you out. Correct. Because there's a lot of people saying, oh, he's coming up for the 20 years. He'll be starting to... to progress he'll be starting to move towards parole nope he won't he won't address offending behavior because he has no offending behavior to address and that means he is stuck yeah they're and gonna 20 say 20 years will come and go they're just gonna say he's a lying murdering psychopath yep. who won't confess to his crimes he's absolutely showing no remorse he's a threat to society we're never gonna let this guy out this is the catch-22 of the innocent person we recently had Linda Calvi on, who did 18 years for murder she hadn't committed. And um, she could have got out. All she had to do was say, mm -hmm. I did it. I'm sorry. You know, I'm reformed. I'm just going to go out there and be a, a good member of society. And they would have let her out. But there are people who are, their conscience is such, they will not admit to something they've not done and they will sacrifice their own lives. And it doesn't get braver than that. And and it, 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 we've got exactly the same thing here with Luke. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say in conclusion then to people watching? Could happen to anybody. It could happen to anybody. And yeah, we need to get Luke home. But we need to find a way to stop this. Just to stop it happening in the first place. And that means a bit, a bit of oversight, certainly from the justice system itself. It needs to have a look at itself. Is it going to do that with the amount of money that, that's floating about? Unlikely. But again, it's that's done in our names. All of it is done in our names. And if we say, no more, no more, we're not having it, then the pressure is on. Then the change has to come. And that's... And the good people in the system could potentially rise up... Yeah. And examine this themselves. So that's on your conscience if you're not doing that. Like I said, there's good and bad people in every profession. And obviously this case has um, come about because of some of the more corrupt people. Maybe people who had good intentions but did some criminal things thinking that they were right. But now, after all this time of all this information coming out, this should be looked at and it should be reversed. So please let us know in the comments what you think of this. If you want to see our interviews with Johnny Boy Steele in the, in the True Crime Podcast playlist, you know, I just absolutely salute him for bringing this to my attention. And um, I commend the work that he's doing on this, and I hope people are joining him on these, these protests and putting the posters up. And um, if you do want to get involved in this in any way, obviously contact Sandra she doesn't want people taking matters into their own hands this has to be done in a very specific focused way so problems do not arise and a huge thank you to all the new subscribers subscription logos in the corner of the screen and most of all huge thank you to Sandra for coming down today on such short notice to raise awareness of such an important case and you know, I'd like to send Luke some books as well, so I'll, I'll get his prison address after this and um, see what, what we can do for him. So, so huge, huge thank you for coming on. Thank really you. appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you Thanks. so much for the, yeah. the opportunity to reach more people. Yeah, brilliant. Well done. Thank you.